Good morning, class. Uh, today, we'll discuss about the Gulen Barry syndrome. I am Dr. Bhupendra Saha, Assistant Professor of Department of Internal Medicine at PP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences. So, what we are going to discuss in today's session? So, we'll discuss uh, about the history of this condition that is GBS and We'll also discuss why we need to know about GBS at the MBBS level. We'll also discuss about the pathogenesis in brief. We'll discuss about its variant clinical feature and the management of GBS in today's lecture. Can you see this picture? Okay. The first person, the name, the can you recognize him? He is the Landry. Okay, he is the Landry. Actually, uh, he had described uh, this condition uh, prior to this uh, three scientists uh, where he uh, wrote uh, in a statement that this is a condition where there is a like the ascending type of the weakness uh, like predominantly in the distal muscles and preceded by some type of tingling sensation. Uh, so he described this condition initially. Later on, these three scientists described uh, these conditions where there is the oreflexic paralysis in two patients and who recovered later on and on doing the lumbar puncture, there was the albuminocytological dissociation. Later, with regard to this name, this condition is called Gwen Barry. Sometimes it's also called Gwen Barry Landry syndrome as well. So these are the scientists who have described these conditions. Why this syndrome was like uh, when they described these conditions at the time, like this became uh, like significant because one of the commonest cause of the paralysis at the time was the poliomyelitis and which progresses and like which did not recover spontaneously or fully. But this condition mimics the poliomyelitis but recovered fully. Okay, so and this was not the infectious condition because in the LP the cell counts are normal. So this conditions was the like new for them at that time and they, they coined this term Gwen Barry. So later on, near about 1956, uh, this, uh, his, his name is Miller Fisher, who described the one important variant of the uh, Gwen Barry syndrome, where there is the uh, reflexia, ataxia, and the ophthalmoplegia. Again, it's the uh, reflexia, meaning that when you, when you try to elicit the reflex, there is absent reflex, when patient tries to walk, then like, like there is a there's loss of coordination and patient have ataxia. And on doing the ocular examination, the patient have the ophthalmoplegia. Okay. So later on, this condition is called the Miller-Fisher syndrome and it's one of the variant of the gwen Barry syndrome. Okay. So why we need to about... Uh, why we need to know about this condition? Uh, this is the one of the leading cause of the acute flaccid paralysis in developed countries. In developing nations, it was it is the poliomyelitis, but in the developed countries, it's the acute flaccid is the one it is the leading cause of acute flaccid paralysis. Uh, and most of the patient like uh, recovered, but some patient may need ventilation, so that's why you need to diagnose this condition. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the appropriate time and, and we need to intubate them and we need to give them a ventilatory support. But despite our supports, like patient can die, like around 4 to 15 percent of patient can die if they suffer from the GBS. In the last week, I, I, I have encountered similar case where there is a 42 year old male patient 
I initially uh, presented to the medical OPD. And on asking the history, the patient had history of the diarrhea two weeks prior to this presentation. He told us that he had weakness in the lower limb. After admit, admission to the, to the ward, the, the, the weakness, weakness progresses and involve up, even the upper limb. And on day third of admission, he had even the shortness of breath. On AVG, there was the high, raised PCO2 level, signifying that the patient had the diaphragmatic palsy at that time. We have started the, uh, the IVIG, and as it is a drug of choice for these conditions. Later on, we intubated that patient, but because of the autonomic dysfunction, we could not salvage that patient. So this is one of the sad story, but uh, but all of us can understand something about the GBS from the sad story of our patient. Okay. So regarding the pathogenesis, uh, as an MBBS student, I'm not going to explain the details of the pathogenesis, but when someone asks you about the pathogenesis of the GBS, then definitely uh, GBS is a condition uh, which involves especially the peripheral knobs and the, it's only the, the knobs, it also involves the knob roots and the plexus. That's why it's also called the polyradiculo plexopathy because it doesn't involve only the peripheral knob, it also involves the roots and as well as the plexus. It does not involve the central nervous system. Okay. When, it, because it is one of the autoimmune condition, autoimmune condition, but there's a formation of the antibody. And antibody actually form against the organism that cause the diarrhea like Campylobacter zezuni. And the antibody that is formed against that Campylobacter zezuni or other organism that cause other sorts of infection, that antibody actually attack the myelin seat of the peripheral knobs. When it attacks the myelin seat of the peripheral knob, there is the breakage of the myelin seat and the knob became devilinated. And you can see here when there is a, what is the function of myelin then? If there's a myelin seat here because of the insulation, the signal transferred from one node of Ranvir to the another node of Ranvir, this is called the saltatory conductions. It, it, rap, it can rapidly uh, do the saltatory conduction from one node of Ranvir to another node of Ranvir, the rapid conductions. But when there is the loss of myelin, then, then uh, the nerve impulse cannot do the saltatory conduction. It has to travel through the axons, which is relatively uh, like slower in conduction. That is why when there, when there is a loss of myelin, so there is a delay in the nerve conduction transmission. So this is what happens in the gulen barry syndrome. So gulen barry syndrome is a central nervous system pathology or peripheral nervous system pathology. Think in the peripheral nervous system pathology. In the peripheral nerve, it attacks where? Roots, plexus, and the knobs. In, in this area, it attacks where? Axon or myelin? It attacks myelin. So what attack the myelin? It's the antibody. From where the antibody forms? Antibody forms against the different organism. Okay? Be, 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 be because of the molecular mimicry, that antibody also kills the myelin. That's why we need to take the proper history when you're evaluating a patient, or patient with the acute passive paralysis because some of the patient can give history of the diarrhea or respiratory tract infection or uh, this type of infection in the past. Okay. Okay. Then the clinical feature wise. So one important clinical feature or the common, common clinical feature uh, that gives us clue for the diagnosis of this condition is the muscle weakness. Usually, though muscle weakness can occur at, at any area, some patient can have muscle weakness even in the neck region uh, and some patient can have the hands. But most of the time, they have the muscle weakness in the legs. 
the usually it's the acute one like similar to the history that i have given you this progressive and it, it it is symmetrical like it it occurs it it causes the weakness in both the limbs both the upper limb and both the lower limb like that and usually the like it has a progressive course it in peaks most of the time the it peaks by the end of two weeks and then later on uh, it regresses okay later on regresses by third weeks and most of the patient get recovered by fourth weeks so it is the way we have to suspect when there's acute onset of symmetrical progressive weakness and there can be concomitant facial weakness as you know that the cranial nerves are, are also the facial nerve sorry cranial nerves are also the peripheral nerves there is also involvement of the different cranial nerves and the common cranial nerve that is involved with facial nerve that's why the patient can have facial nerve weakness even they can have bulbar weakness like they can have difficulty in swallowing the food and the water okay they can have that type of weakness that that's why you need to evaluate, evaluate. and the important clinical pitch feature of the gvs and the common cause of the death of the gvs is the dysautonomia dysautonomia okay where there is autonomic dysfunctions like patient can have suddenly can go into the tachycardia and can 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 go into bradycardia then they can have a suit up of the hypotension sometimes they can have hypotension hypertension like that so this kind of dysautonomia that's why uh, uh, most of the patient of gvs need to be admitted in the critical care because uh, it's very difficult to uh, to monitor the autonomic dysfunction in the ward without monitor and some of the patient uh, can have the respiratory failure uh, respiratory failure uh, and because of the diaphragmatic palsy uh -huh. and respiratory muscle paralysis they can have respiratory failures and it's the it's the most common cause of death in a patient with gbs so i should always like uh, be vigilant regarding the respiratory failure but interesting thing is that the though they can complain the sensory symptoms in the initial days but the sensory deficit are minimal and on examination sensory deficit are minimal there is like since there is pure motor weakness okay regarding the bladder and bowel like uh, they can have bladder and bowel involvement uh, for the initial 3 to 4 days but later on uh, there is no like bladder and bowel involvement so persistence of bladder and bowel of involvement is against the gvs and persistence of bladder and bowel favors the diagnosis of transverse myelitis which is one of the like closest td of this condition okay so why patient die in a in a gbs the most of the patient die because of the respiratory failure uh, that's why we need to intubate them and we need to give the ventilator support till they recover okay uh then regarding the variants of gbs so one in the com the commonest variant is the uh aidp uh, in the short form is the aidp variant like this one is the commonest and variant is the one of the mcq question okay mcq question for you people mc is acute inflammatory demyelinating uh polyneuropathy okay uh, second variant is uh, acute motor axonal neuropathy where they, we have uh, discussed that in the gbs that mostly the there is a demyelination but there can be the uh, axonal variant as well and there is also the acute uh, motor sensory axonal neuropathy so we don't accept the sensor involvement in gbs commonly but they can sometimes rarely they can have sensor involvement as well as uh, that what you call the msan that is called acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy this is mn and this is msan and this is ardp okay and the one is the miller fisher variant uh, what is the triad of miller fisher variant or reflexia uh, ataxia and the ophthalmoplegia okay these are the variants there are other variants of gbs as well but uh, for the mbbs level i don't think it's, uh, it's it's necessary for you people that's why i didn't discuss two important tests that we usually do uh, when you suspect a patient with gbs is one is lumbar puncture we we, we have to do sometimes lumbar puncture like uh, we have already discussed how to do the lumbar puncture in the lumbar puncture we have to in the lumbar puncture what we see we see we see the csf analysis and the usually cell counts are normal in case of gbs are usually less than 50 uh, cells per millimeter of csf and proteins are usually elevated and this condition is called albuminological cytological dysfunction if the cell count is uh, normal and protein is elevated 
Now, what does it mean to you? Probably there is no infection. Was yes, and protein is elevated means probably there is some like utter, uh, immune attack in in the CSF space. Perfect. Yes, there is definitely like, immune attack. That's why the protein is elevated because of the immunoglobulins they like that. And the cell count is normal because it's not a infective conditions. Okay. Second test that we need to do is the NORP conduction velocity test that is called NCV, uh, where we can see, uh, we, we can differentiate whether it's the axonal variant, axonal type or the demyelinating type. Uh, in case of demyelinating type, what you see is a demyelinating type. So that's a, there is a, uh, the NORP conduction velocity is slowed because of like the loss of saltatory conduction and there's a prolonged distal latency. When you give the stimulus, then it, it will take uh, more time than the usual. That's called the prolonged distal latency. So it's the usual finding of the GBS, but uh, like if you do uh, after like weeks, then you may also get the finding of axonal neuropathy even in GBS. Okay. So two, these are two important tests. Other tests uh, we have to do uh, like for to rule out the alternatives, like we can do the complete blood clown test. And we have to always do the sodium and potassium because the uh, hypokalemia, which can cause the acute quadruparesis is important DDs of this condition. That's why you have to always look for the electrolyte level, sodium, potassium, and calcium level we have to do. Okay, uh, and um, these are the common tests that we do. Uh, regarding the, how we can diagnose the GBS, there is very, very simple uh, criteria to diagnose the GBS. So there are six criteria. The one important criteria, is the, one is uh, as a presentation, clinical presentation is the how the patient present. There is a, Bilateral uh, flaccid weakness of limbs. There's a, there is weakness of the limbs. This is bilateral. And uh, on examination, there is the um, decrease or deep tendon reflex. So if there is a decrease or absent uh, deep tendon reflex, it supports uh, our diagnosis of GVS. And on like, let's suppose if you keep that patient in the ward, then what will be the pattern? Like it has a monophasic. It is not like relapsing and remitting. If there is a frequent relapse and rem remitting, then it, it supports the diagnosis of CITP, not GVS. So it is a monophasic and as to show there is the onset and the nadir of weakness between 12 hours to 28 days. Most of the patient get recovered within 28 days. Okay. So there are three important criteria. And on work, working of the patient, like NCV, which should be consistent with GBS and the CSF should be, there should be cyto dissociation. But definitely we have to always rule out the alternative diagnosis. If you have another all limb weakness and have potassium level of 2.3, then we cannot make the GBS in that person. Okay, that's the hypokalemic para 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 paralysis. So, okay, we have to give the some diagnostic certainty. So, if the, all the criteria are met, it's a level one certainty. Okay, if the criteria is one, two, three, uh, four, or five plus six, then level two, and if there is one, two, three, and six, then level three. Mind that if there is a weakness, okay. If there is a bilateral weakness, if there is absent reflex, and if there is a, there is a, like pattern peak and on peak and uh, like uh, it recovered within 28 days, but this LP is normal and CS NCV is normal, uh, but we have ruled out already the alternative diagnosis and we can give the level three. So level uh, we have to give the if a different diagnosis certainty by the Brinkton, okay. So. Uh, how to treat the patient? So usually we have to treat the patient in intensive care unit. Why? Because uh, because of two conditions. One one condition is that patient can develop the respiratory par paralysis at any time and may need ventilator support at any time. That's why if we need to uh, take care of them in an intensive care unit. Another is the, the one of the important like manifestation of GVS is the autonomic dysfunctions and suddenly they can have hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, and that's why we need to admit them in the ICU and do the regular monitoring of the patient. So what are the treatment options? So some uh, uh, some of the students uh, might tell, oh, sir, we have to use steroid. Steroid has no use in GBS. Mind, mind okay. Uh, always note that, okay, steroid has no use in GBS. So we have two options. One is immunoglobulin and the plasmapheresis. Plasmapheresis was used earlier than the immunoglobulin in GBS. Um, like they are equally effective and the immunoglobulin, uh, the dose is 2 gram per kg, like uh, we have to give the total dose 2 gram per kg, but we give 400 mg uh, per kg 
uh, five doses that's become two gram per kg okay it's one of the uh, like quite exp expensive drug and it can cost near about two to 2.5 lakh nepali rupees and when we use this immunoglobulin is our plasma phases that like if there is the progressive pattern of the weakness then we have to use if there is a progressive pattern of weakness, only then we have to use if the weak the if the weakness is achieved is like stationary or is if the weakness is static or is stationary then we need not use the plasma phase that's why you need to you need to monitor the patient like hour by hour and day by day like if you see like oh no is the weakness is like going on like weakness is like increasing then counsel your patient and do the and do this type of therapy like most of the time most of the time we use immunoglobulin here at pvkss okay but despite our therapy your patient can get uh, sick and we need to intubate them and like and give the respiratory support for that we have to have uh, we have to monitor their force vital capacity by uh, pocket head spirometry if it is less than 20 ml per kg and we can also see the inspiratory pressure by, by that pocket held spirometry be less than 30 cm and expiratory by more less than 40 cm of water then uh, we need to intubate them and give a respiratory support. But this pocket health spirometry may not be available in the ward. That's why we need to monitor them by doing the simple breath side test. Like we can do the single breath testing, single breath testing. Okay. So take home measures for this today's presentation is uh, gulen barre syndrome is the is the one of the most common cause of acute facet paralysis in the adult. So always suspect the GBS in, in, a, in an each and every patient who present with acute facet paralysis. Uh, so GBS is like GB uh, in the GBS, uh, it, there, there is usually the recovery by the end of four weeks and sensory deficit are minimal and bladder bowel are usually not involved in case of GBS. Two important tests that we do for uh, diagnosis of GBS is the lumbar puncture, where you see the albuminocytosis dissociation, and NCV, where you see the demyelinating pattern. Uh, we need to know about the Brinkton criteria to diagnose these conditions, and the immunoglobulin and plasma phases are the treatment of choice, which, which both of them are equally effective. And these are these are this uh, treatment modalities should be used only if there is a progressive GBS. Thank you, thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you have understood something about the GBS. If you have any comments and queries regarding GBS, you can write in the comment section. I'll be there to help you people. Thank you.